record yes all right and i will we will talk about blockchain and some aspects of cryptocurrencies but while i was preparing the lecture um i got sidetracked a little bit um and i think um in the context of the the blockchain lecture um and the course itself we could spend some time discussing the COVID tracking. Um, so COVID tracking is kind of a, a, a very hot topic. Um, there is a number of apps uh, that have been developed for this purpose. And I wanted to sort of challenge you um, to come up with a mechanism that you would propose for COVID tracking. So you are kind of experts you are you know almost masters in computer science you know mobile devices you know programming you know some kind of a sensory uh, data collection mechanisms like gps or um, other means so spend some time now thinking how would you devise a, a mechanism for tracking COVID spreading, what could you use? So kind of I will start um, the, the most trivial way and the most kind of um, easy, let's say to think of is you make an app which stores a person location and then this app um, keeps track of where the person was using GPS. <clears throat> and it is stored on a local device. And then everybody's phones are doing the same thing, right? So now um, if I got sick, I notify everybody about where I was in the last two weeks or whatever the time, time frame is. And then everybody's app will check if they were where I was near me and then they will be notified, okay? So that, that is kind of a, a, a very simple, uh, naive way of solving the problem. So what would you think are the advantages and disadvantages of this solution? You need to participate. So I will make a new slide. So simple GPS based tracker. So what are the um, disadvantages? Anyone? Okay, I can see some chat answers. Um, so privacy, um, that's right. So uh, privacy is a kind of a problematic, as you as you said. Um, the um, the there are two aspects to privacy. So one is. Um, where I was in the last two weeks is, is leaked, right? So um, people don't need to know where I was, but um, they need to know where I was to see if they were close to me, right? So we have kind of a trade-off, right? Um, so there is a location, um, so that data uh, location, personal, location data is leaking and then the the bigger one is you have to um leak it to everybody right because you don't know in advance uh who was near me so you have to notify everybody where i was such that they can check if they were near me even if they were not near me they still need to be notified right uh, so it's 
not only my personal data is leaking, but it's also leaking globally. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so um, what, what can we do? Uh, so Thomas is um, suggesting that um, we, so, so can you explain, Tomas, what, what, do you th what do you think? Yeah, that's right. So we don't need to um, share um, the actual personal data, but we need to, to leak the location, right? So location is shared. Uh, no personal data is shared, but um, you will basically get an anonymous trace of someone who is sick and you don't know who that person is, but you know where they were about. And then from the trace, from the location trace, you may be able to infer who that person is, uh, especially if you are the person who was kind of nearby. So if I see a trace and I see I go to work and it's somebody who is kind of uh, near me at, you know, for the last 14 days in those locations, like in cafeteria or somewhere, I, I will kind of be able to work it out. Um, so I, the, the, the people who are near the sick person may work out who that sick person is. Uh, everybody else may not be able to work it out. So that's correct. Yeah. Um, that's right. So th this is kind of a, um, the assumption, right? So we're not really leaking the personal data, we're sort of leaking the personal location uh, data. Um, so what can we do to prevent that? Uh, yeah, that's right. So what, what is the typical way of solving this, um, this problem? So we, again, we have the same system. I'm storing where I was on my phone. Everybody else is doing that. But now instead of me brought like, let's say uh, only the sick person kind of uh, notifies everybody, right? So now I am sick. Uh, I know I am sick. So I got uh, tested and I need to notify. So we have a problem if I kind of notify everybody. Uh, so what could we do instead? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so Thomas was kind of a suggesting some sort of algorithm that like, I don't need to learn about, um, you know, where I was or not on when it happened, but you know, I, I need to have an app, right? So, so we have kind of a two, two things here. So I have my personal data stored on my device and there is an app and I may or may not have access to this app, right? Um, if I share my location data with somebody else's app, the app may decide, okay, uh, your line crosses with this person's line anonymously and only tells the person, yes, you might be, uh, you might have gone in contact with somebody sick and the person doesn't learn anything, right? Um, so that's kind of the, we assuming uh, the app does not allow a person to browse the data, right? So the app kind of is secure in a sense that a, an owner of the app, like if you install this app on your phone, will not be able to browse the, browse the data, right? Um, and that is a kind of a question mark. Um, so, you know, normally that is possible. So normally you can have an app that is storing certain things in a user inaccessible fashion. And then the app tells the user, oh yeah, you are fine. You know, your line didn't cross anybody who notified about the sick traces. Uh, or you might have crossed, uh, as Tomasz suggests, that's fine. Um, and this data is stored in an inaccessible um, 
part of the mobile device, but you can always root your device or you can kind of gain super user access and then you see everything which is in, in, in your device, right? So that will work to most of people, but it will not work for everybody. If you have a rooted device, it will not work, right? So, um, so we have kind of a rooted or not rooted device problem. And then there is also, um, you, you, we usually have something on the modern smartphones. We have something which is called a trusted um, execution environment and the environment that allows a T, which allows apps to store something with a hardware encryption or kind of a software encryption, which is not rootable by rooting the device. So this is kind of a software hardware combo, which allows storing private keys or storing certain things that even if you have a rooted device, you will not be able to access that. Uh, it, it kind of provides like a trusted secure enclave. Um, so we have secure enclave, which kind of allows you to store and keep data secure even if the device itself is compromised, even if you have some malware or even if the operating system is compromised. And banks and banking apps usually use that to make sure that when you're doing some mobile banking, um, then you are kind of protected from kind of abuse by malware. And that's why, you know, some people, for example, uh, not use mobile phones for doing banking operations, but in fact, it's safer most of the time to do that on the mobile device than it is on your laptop or browser. Um, but anyway, we, we have those two kind of solutions, right? So this one doesn't really solve it. Um, if we rely on the, um, and, uh, the space which is not accessible to the user, but this one would kind of solve it, right? So that's one possible, uh, this, this could possibly work. Uh, uh, this will not really work. And then uh, Tomasz is suggesting uh, using some backend computing, right? And that's, that's true. So what we could do is we could use kind of a cloud service, uh, which is some, which is doing some of the um, computations for us. And this is where trust comes in, right? So trust is a big word here. So we would need to send our data to a third party and then the third party would calculate all the crossings of the traces and will notify only the people who should be notified, right? So I don't need to share my data with everybody. I only need to share it with a single provider or single cloud service. And then other people kind of uh, uh, share data with them as well. And then you have the the notification spread all over, right? So this is where trust comes in and this is where government supported apps come in, right? So you kind of agree with this? Yeah. Yeah, so Nicola is saying uh, we can send those, um, like uh, Tomasz is saying we can send this data anonymously. So we don't need to send kind of uh, personal data, but we have to send association between the trace and the device, right? Um, so, and Tomasz is also kind of uh, thinking that like what, what we need to send. So we need to send a trace that, that we have to send. And then we have to send some kind of um, anonymous or pseudo anonymous ID, which links uh, us or our phone with the trace, right? So we have us and our phone linked with the trace. Um, and then um, when 
the calculation happens. The calculation says this trace and this ID are crossed, right? Because a, a, a sick person will have a particular trace and healthy people will have traces. And then the computation says, okay, this is, this is all the IDs of people who were in contact with this sick trace, right? Uh, so theoretically, no personal information is shared, but again, we have some sort of a leakage between those um, uh, IDs and the traces, right? But it is kind of good. So th this sort of works um, to some extent. And th this is, you know, you know the, the single service doesn't need to know that Marius is sending this trace. They just have some sort of a hash-like string which associates my phone and this particular identity with the trace, right? So we have this kind of concept here of those pseudonymous identities, right? Um, yeah. So, and then we can communicate over HTTPS. So there is no additional leakage of the information, but there is this um, small remaining problem of the pseudonyms being attached to the traces, right? And as long as pseudonyms be, uh, uh, remains anonymous, that it's not linked to me, then it's fine, it will work. But it has kind of a, a, a small drawback um, because if a particular, particular uh, pseudonymous pseudonym is de anonymized, so if someone links this particular pseudonym, this particular pseudo ID with me, then all the data the single entity has is kind of uh, associating all the traces with me, right? Um, so then system leaks uh, private location data, right? Um, so it kind of works but it is a little bit weak in a context of this breaking the anonymity of those IDs, right? Um, so what can we do? What can we do better than this? Yeah, we would like to nothing to be stored. That would be great. But then we have to trust these guys not to store anything, right? Um, so if they promise us not to store anything, just do the calculations on the fly. Yes, fine, but you know, we may or may not be able to trust them. So we have this um, kind of a trust issue here. Yeah, so anonymity works both ways. Uh, so the sick people and the, all the traces are basically linked with the uh, an anonymity here. Um, yeah, that's right. So the, the sick person doesn't reveal who they are. They only say, um, they send the trace with the flag saying, yeah, we th this is a sick trace. Um, yeah, so Tomasz is kind of saying, yeah, this boils down to distrust. So can we do better than, can we do better than this? pseudonymous IDs. Yeah, we could, um, we could have additional, um, so th th this is like what, how governance works. Uh, I, I think what Tomasz is suggesting is that we include additional trusted uh, party, so additional uh, ID resolver, which, uh, for example, uh, which uh, this intermediates between the uh, so, uh, anonymous IDs and what is shown to the government 
supported app, right? So then the government cannot link the tracks to the pseudonyms because there is additional resolver which is in the middle when it disintermediates that uh, the resolution. Uh, or, yeah, or, um, or additional service that does part of the computing. Uh, but that is a little bit problematic because somebody needs to get the traces and the traces have to be passed around. So if the government is doing this, um, um, yeah, so we, we can try to hide who is sending and who is kind of uh, using the, the traces, but it kind of gets, uh, you know, we try to do, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think that would work, but it, it kind of is effectively similar to this, uh, which in this breaks this link because we have this link here, uh, ID to trace. And then with this one, what, what happens is we have uh, the original ID through some, um, through additional kind of um, temporary ID maybe to track and then this one calculates like somebody calculates this and somebody knows those things but they don't know this to this link and then this to this link is kind of always mediated by this extra service such that it's mediated by this link right so nobody knows um so uh one party knows temporary ID to track, to, to trace. Let's call it for consistency traces. So one party knows this, and then another party knows ID to temporary trace. And no one knows ID to trace directly, right? So by this, we kind of disintermediated it, okay? So that's great. So we have like, that, that would kind of work, but you need to trust that those two entities don't collude with each other. Because if they talk with each other and say, oh yeah, I have this temporary ID, oh, I have this, this one, and they can kind of re, repro uh, reproduce this link, right? If they collude with each other, if they are separate and neither of them, like if one of them tries to cheat, they cannot cheat. They can only cheat if they co collaborate together to cheat. Um, so that could, that could work, right? Um, all right, so can you do better? Uh, so the first option we've used is uh, with GPS, right? Um, what else could you do? Can, can we do contact tracing without GPS? Yeah, very good, Bluetooth, perfect. Um, yes, Wi-Fi Direct also, Wi-Fi Direct. What else did we do last semester? Direct. What else did we discuss last semester? We haven't really done it, but uh, that, involved a uh, microphone and um, speakers. We can use ultrasonic sounds, okay? So we can have one device broadcasting some ultrasonic sounds from time to time, and the other devices near me kind of listening. And then if they pick up that sound, they kind of uh, know that they were near me at the given time. So. Um, we could use Bluetooth, we could use Wi-Fi direct, we could use ultrasonic sounds. Um, we, like with, with sounds and with all those technologies, it, it will work really well if the phone is in the pocket um, and depending yeah, on the 
power consumption, they could use one of those, right? There is slight difference now because we know what other devices were near me at a given time. And also we know how far they were because we can measure it by the Bluetooth strength or the Wi-Fi strength or the kind of uh, uh, audio signal, right? Uh, you can just say audio in general. Um, but we don't know where people physically were, okay? So here, uh, with, with the first approach, we know physical location. With this approach, we don't know where people are, but we know who was with whom, who was near whom, right? Uh, so in, in practice, if I have access to my own device and I can log where I am, so I am kind of combining those three plus uh, my own personal GPS track, tracker, I can associate other people whereabouts by, by tracking myself, right? But for a third party who will only get this data, they cannot do that, right? So from privacy point of view, this one is a bit simpler to analyze because the location is sort of the, the, the common and we kind of exchange it with others. Here, we have two aspects. Like if we use this mechanism with what we just discussed here, um, the, the trust, you know, it, it's kind of more complicated and a, a little bit simpler uh, because I like this information, like the, um, the uh, connectivity between people and timestamps doesn't necessarily leak any location information per se, right? So if two people sent to a trusted, um, trusted uh, a government service, yeah, we were together in this, like in this timestamp, the government doesn't know, um, doesn't know where they were physically, but it knows that they were together, right? So um, we, if we go back here, um, now this trust is not about the location, it's about kind of um, togetherness, let's say, right? So that um, some people were near each other at particular time, but it doesn't really leak the information of, um, of where, right? Whereas here um, with, with the GPS one, um, we, we went where, and then from where the service was inferring that togetherness, right? Togetherness. So in fact, um, like for the, for the tracker, we don't need to know where people were. We only need to know the togetherness property, right? Where people together. And then that's what we were doing, the calculations of whether the traces were crossing, right? whether they were together. But if information being shared is already this one, then the location information is not, is not needed. And the trust only now concerns the togetherness, right? So, you know, this is uh, privacy, privacy of togetherness versus uh, location or, you know, whereabouts. It's, you understand that, right? It's a little bit different. So if I need to trust somebody uh, with my location, they can misuse it for different things. Like for example, um, somebody may learn that I am going out of my house on a regular basis and I'm not at home, so they can break into my house, right? That's what the location leakage is about. The togetherness is like something else. It sort of demonstrates that for example, I'm regularly near somebody else and maybe the, I have a relationship, right? So for example, if I am uh, cheating on my wife and I'm together with a particular you know, uh, person on a regular basis, sometime when my wife thinks I'm at home, then it creates this sort of suspicion that I'm kind of cheating on her. So the togetherness leaks certain privacy things 
but it's different than the location. But again, it is something that we want to kind of prevent to be leaking, right? Um, so in this, in, in this case, um, we have similar mechanisms like um, to associate some IDs with this kind of a togetherness information. Uh, and then somebody needs to decide that um, when the announcement happens, like I'm sick, then I have to notify everybody that I was together with in the last two weeks, right? Um, yeah, that's right. So, so Thomas summarized that, uh, that as well. Um, so now we, we kind of, in, in this mechanism, and again, we need to, um, like, so my phone stores uh, who I was nearby in the past 14 days. And then I have to notify everybody else who was near, near me that I am sick, right? So if I get sick, I have to notify them. But all I have is, um, so I have the IDs or the, you know, um, pseudonyms of, um, pseudonyms or IDs based, let's say we're using Bluetooth, right? Um, so based off Bluetooth devices that were near me, but then I don't know who those people are. I don't know, um, like how to notify them that I'm sick and they were near me, right? I know they were near me because I also co collected who was near me, but I have no way of like notifying them. Also, if some, let's say I'm, I'm healthy, but I was near a sick person and then the sick person ID is kind of a broadcasted, then I could check if I was near that person, right? So we can do it both ways. Either the, the um, like kind of a global announcement of sick IDs, right? So if I got sick, I then broadcast my ID to everybody. Um, and then if everybody can check, oh yeah, I was near that person uh, from their own local traces, or we do kind of a secure cloud-based government app. And then I don't need to announce it globally. I just need to announce it to the government, right? Um, so if I announce it to the government, then the government could kind of uh, check all those uh, togetherness and then um, spread the information to the uh, people who are near me. Yeah, that's right. So we have the same problems and we can use the same solutions, right? So if we... Um, uh, try to de-associate who is who by having kind of uh, pseudonyms and then having some sort of this and this and intermediation service, then we can kind of uh, pull it out, right? Um, but it, um, it, it still um, relies on the kind of the trust in the, in the kind of the government app. So the togetherness information actually is more harmful from the privacy perspective than the location one, um, because it kind of, um, it's like, as, as we were describing here, the togetherness is inferred from location, but this is kind of um, a, a very information rich kind of, uh, thing. So that's one aspect. The second aspect is Bluetooth, Wi-Fi direct to some extent, they have kind of a hardware, um, uh, hardware based um, IDs. And we talked about it last semester, then that if we leak this, then it's really easy for somebody to track us to kind of a keep kind of a um, the record of our physical device, which then can be leaked and can be used for tracking. So even though it is pseudonym, 
it is kind of a permanent pseudonym and one once de-anonymized uh, for example by going through a particular shop gate with a camera I can kind of uh, have a, a system you know even in the school where when you entering a building I can record everybody who enters the building and I just record by you know a scan of a bluetooth devices what was your bluetooth id and then I will de-anonymize you right so um the anonymization of the of this hardware based ideas is easy so we should not use it right uh in the context of the uh, wi-fi direct is very similar and then in the context of ultrasonic audio it's not because we're just broadcasting a particular signal and then it can be software generated right so if this id is permanent it has the same disadvantages as hardware based but if this ids are temporary um then we have kind of a, a, a huge advantage here, right? And the same here. So instead of sharing Bluetooth and Wi-Fi direct hardware IDs, could we share a temporary IDs instead? And the answer is not really, because to communicate with somebody else over Bluetooth, I have to establish a communication and I have to learn what this other people Bluetooth ID is, right? So on the operating system level, this needs to be known. From the application layer, that could be potentially disintermediated by the um, some sort of third party service or kind of a protocol, right? So this is exactly what, um, so if I kind of inject one more slide. So Apple and Google, solution to this is that they've updated the operating system and they've introduced this kind of a layer uh, layer of this intermediation uh, for um, Bluetooth based togetherness tracking. And how does it work? It works that instead of exchanging the hardware IDs of the Bluetooth devices, of devices near me, um, the driver and the kind of the operating system layer has ability to generate random IDs on a kind of a temporal basis. And usually it is every 15 minutes it is changed. Um, 15 minute based temporal IDs which are um, exchanged. So I learn um, about an ID of nearby devices, but those are not hardware IDs. Those are kind of a very temporal kind of uh, fluid IDs. And um, every 14 days, days the IDs are deleted. Um, and every request for sharing temporal IDs needs to have user approval, okay? So they, they basically did what we were discussing here. Um, instead of trace, of the physical GPS trace, uh, the devices just store other temporal IDs which were nearby with a particular timestamp. Uh, the temporal IDs are generated by the operating system and the kind of a secure protocol to, to disintermediate the actual physical device and the hardware ID of the Bluetooth. And then this happens automatically by the API, uh, which is exposed. Um, so there is an API exposed to application developers and they can basically do what they want with this sort of API. So Apple and Google are not storing anything. All this data is stored on the device only, and then the applications will kind of use it, right? So then the application um, can be built on top of this infrastructure. Um, let me read your comments. Um, yep, 
Yeah, so uh, Morten asks how they exchange. They cannot exchange the information without establishing the um, uh, establishing the communication, right? But this information is sort of hidden from the um, application by means of the this, this intermediation from the API and what the operating system is doing. So if you can root your device and if you install kind of a modified app, then yes, you can still uh, cheat the system, right? Uh, I don't know on, on exactly on which layer they've done it and whether they've used the trusted, um, whether they've kind of uh, use the uh, the TEE for any of it but I would suspect that you're right uh, that if I root my device if I fiddle with the driver and with the operating system and hack the app then I may be able to use this API and these mechanisms to actually learn about the physical um, uh, about the physical IDs of the hardware Bluetooth connections of the devices which sent me the temporal IDs, right? So if I do that on, on this single device, if I walk around, I can associate the hardware IDs, uh, this, those hardware IDs to the temporal IDs which are shared with me. And then I may be able to de-anonymize some of the uh, temporal IDs to a person, but it only gives me partial trace and only for some of those temporal IDs, right? So yes, the hacking is possible, but the hacking is limited to 15 minutes based when this ID was valid. So if the person went somewhere else, they will be sharing other IDs which are random and then whatever I learned is very short lived. And then all those uh, IDs are deleted anyway after 14 days. So unless you have an army of people with all those rooted devices which are kind of uh, in you know uh, spread around and collecting data then your type your kind of a person personal data type of attack is very limited so i think it is possible but it it has kind of a small um small and short implications right so morton um i, I think you're right but it, it is sort of limited um, and then if, if you learned, uh, later out, out, outside of this range, then it will be useless, right? Because this is kind of a hard coded limitation of the, of the API. So Tomas, you also write, then, you know, this is designed to work relatively on kind of a small temporal scale for the reasons of, of hacking as we, we, we just des described. Um, so the way it will work is that if I got sick, I have to send my temporal IDs for the last 14 days to a central server. And then the central server will share those temporal IDs with everybody. Um, and then everybody will learn that they were or they were not near me, right? Um, some apps may, uh, like, you know, because of this, um, if I am healthy and the government apps ask me to share my temporal IDs, I would say, why? I mean, there is no need for me to be sharing with you any temporal IDs. What I expect is I want to get the temporal IDs of people who are sick in the last 14 days, and then I can check if I was near them or if I kind of, uh, potentially was in this togetherness uh, setup. So, you know, only sick people will be sharing data with the uh, government and the go government app or the cloud service will distribute it to everybody, right? So it's sort of like a, a push notification mechanism, right? So now the question is, um, should you use this type of app? So th this is a, a huge improvement uh, this Google and um, Apple and Google uh, initiative um, before COVID-19 tracing uh, because it allows 
a relatively non-intrusive way for a government to design an app uh, that would allow people to share their temporal, the, the sick people to share their temporal IDs and then the personal data implications are minimized. It's not bullet proof. There is some possible uh, space for abuse, of course, but it, it's kind of limited. Uh, so compared to this kind of a GPS um, based tracker, the naive one, um, this initiative is much, much better, right? And then the apps that are using the API, if your phone is not rooted, uh, you as a user can be guaranteed that at least the code you're getting and the behavior of the app is not malicious by any way, uh, because that is kind of impossible, right? It will be um, um, yeah, kind of guaranteed by the approval process and by the kind of uh, private public key cryptography that the code which you are installing is sort of legitimate and the behavior of the operating system and, and so on is also legitimate um, unless your phone is rooted. Uh, if your phone is rooted, then you uh, open for much more abuse from malware. If your phone is not rooted, uh, malware has kind of a limited scope to, to you know, mess up with the system, system level services. It can mess up with the user level services. Uh, so the malware can do what you can do, but the malware cannot do what super user can do if your phone is not rooted, right? Um, so kind of now, you know, um, so should you use one generic app? Not Apple, Google, based this kind of a traffic uh, and should you use the the apple google covid 19 tracing app unfortunately norway doesn't have this one uh that norway doesn't have an, anyone i i, I don't think uh, but I, I know that, I mean, this API is relatively new. It has been uh, released in the last kind of week. Um, so there, is, there are not many apps that support it yet, but some governments are thinking of, you know, uh, using this API to produce the, the apps. Um, and as I said, this is much better improvement uh, compared to the previous era where it was a little bit um, yeah, difficult to assess how much privacy data you're really leaking with a kind of a, um, yeah, um, contact tracing app. Like, so question to you, uh, if there was an app in Norway, which is this, uh, which uses GPS or some other mechanisms, would you use it? Um, would you use it in other countries as well? Uh, and then if there is a government app which has this API, would you use that one? Uh, and if yes, and if no, why, why not? So what do you think? I will move the chat window away so that the, your answers are not recorded. <laughs> so you, you retain your anonymity for whatever you want to say. So yeah, who, who would use the, the first app? Like if there was a generic app produced like by Norwegian government, would you use it? Yeah, so no, 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 so far. So th this one um, raises uh, privacy concerns, right? And I'm, I'm not saying there is some intent for malicious behavior or intent for malicious use of data. It just, bad things happen. Like, you know, services get hacked, data leaks, and bad things may happen. Uh, and 
even if the government was not intending any malicious activities or anything like that, um, you know, the logical answer to the first one is no. Just no, because uh, it, it just is not safe. Um, so the second one, on the other hand, um, Yeah, that's right. So that exactly. So th this one raises a lot of concerns and it is um, data remains valuable even after pandemic and even if it is anonymous, right? That's exactly true. Um, this one is the same. Um, this one is the same as the as as this point um but this one is slightly less harmful so for like for one only sick people trace is leaked uh and the trace is for 14 days um So, yeah, it's still, you know, it, it, it still is that point, right? It, it is still da data and it is still valuable and so on and so forth. It's a little bit limited though. So the trace is only for 14 days and it is cut. Um, so the trace is for 14 days and it's cut into 15 minute intervals. Um, random IDs uh, and that means some certain form of data analytics and so on is also limited. I'm not saying it alleviates all this point but it has lowered the impact or the privacy considerations right so it has less of privacy considerations and then it, it's it, it is kind of um, like if um, so if you are healthy, um, so for healthy people right here, if you opt into the system, if you opt in, but you never share the data that when you get sick, you don't leak anything from you because all the data that you've generated is on your device and you get the benefits of other people notifying, but you are kind of a, uh, like, you know, in the prisoner's dilemma, when you have this kind of a setup where you can defect or uh, collaborate in the system, you are the one who kind of gets the benefits, but at the same time, you're not giving back the fact that when you get sick, right? So it, it kind of raises a bit of an ethics question um, because if you opt in um, and get notif notifications, but never share your own data, then there is this ethics question. But at the same time, if you opt in and never share your data, but get notified that you were in contact of a sick person, then you can quarantine yourself. So then you will kind of benefit the society by doing a quarantine on yourself, right? So even though you're defecting the system by not sharing your when you get sick, right? I'm only this only happens when you get sick and you decide not to share your data, right? Uh, then you have this kind of ethics question, right? Yeah. So Ru is you. Um, so some students are using uh, the uh, the app, and uh, and here you would also be able to use it without sharing your data, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of uh, have an introduction on the, the kind of the way Apple and Google are trying to solve it. And it is kind of the proper way of doing it. It's not the, the ideal way uh, because certain things are still uh, leaking to some extent, um, but it is much better than what was before and much better than those uh, kind of... Uh, apps that are built in ad hoc fashion. Um, so now 
before we go for a break, I will ask you one more question. So, um, so why do we really need government in the in the picture? Why do you think uh, each country is doing their own app? And then if you travel and you were two weeks in Italy and your trace is in, in Italy, should you use the Italian version of the app? Because the Norwegian one will not um, kind of uh, work with the people who were in Italy, right? Like the Norwegian app will only work kind of for Norway. The Italian app will only work for people who are kind of in Italy. And then if you go there, and you're using the Norwegian app, it will have two weeks of traces of people who are in Italy, but not like the Norwegian system will not be able to notify anybody, you know, th those Italians, right? If, if you got sick, right? Um, so it, it kind of doesn't make sense that it is based on the governments doing it for each country separately. Uh, especially in the context of pandemic, right? It's not a local thing, it's a global thing. Um, so the, the first question is, do you really need a government? And if not, how should that be solved such that it still works the same way, but you don't need this uh, trusted, um, single trusted third party? Yeah, that's right. But let's say you, you went to Italy uh, for two weeks and then you got sick. And on the second day you got, uh, you know, uh, notified that you're sick. So now you're saying, okay, I'm sick. So for the 12 days uh, out of the 14, you, th there is no point of letting anybody in Norway know that you're sick because you're out of the country anyway. And then the, the Italians who you met yesterday with, with you, they should go to quarantine, but they will not because you're not using the Italian version, right? Um, that would be ideal, right? So if there is a single app, uh, they, they all agree to use, that would work, but you know, somebody has to have the service of notifying everybody that those IDs, um, like that, that the IDs of people I was in contact with uh, should know that they were in contact with a sick person. Um, the problem is that notifying everybody in the world makes no sense neither, right? Because you should really notify everybody who potentially was near you during the last, 14 days or so. Uh, so currently we're doing it by assuming you were in your country. Uh, if you travel, then you probably should sign up for this other government app and say, okay, now I'm in Italy, so I should notify Italians that I am sick, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, so th this is surprisingly hard question, okay? Um, so the one constraint is uh, we do not want to say where we are. Even I don't want to say I'm in Italy right now, right? So by switching the app, I'm kind of notifying somebody, somebody learns that I'm currently in Italy. I don't want to do that. I don't want anybody to know where I am. Uh, I want to keep the local, the localization information just to me, to myself. Uh, so I don't want to share location, okay? Um, so, not good. Um, uh, notifying everyone in the world about the temporal IDs of let's say of my about my temporal IDs when I get sick is not good neither. Right? So I, I don't want to like once I got sick 
and I have this ethical dilemma like, oh, should I notify everybody that I'm sick? And I choose, yes, I should notify the people who are near me. Um, then this, I should not do it globally to everybody in the world. It kind of, uh, I don't want to share my IDs uh, with everybody in the world, right? Um, so, and I don't want to share location. So we, we kind of seem to have a dilemma, which is unsolvable um, because how would I know um, to whom share my location if I don't know where people are around? And at the same time, I only know the random IDs of people I've met, right? So um, I have my own temporal IDs and I have temporal IDs of people who were near me, okay? But I don't know who they are and how to notify them. So the question remains, um, can this be solved without a trusted third party? Can we have something that allows me to notify people uh, of whom I know uh, temporal IDs um, that they should consider going to quarantine because I am sick. All right, so let's have a break. Um, and then we come back to this question. And that was kind of a long prelude to the blockchain lecture, right? Um, yeah, so Tomasz is kind of uh, onto something uh, and we can kind of explore it a little bit more after the break. So let's have, um, yeah, let's, let's meet at uh, half past one. Okay, so think a little bit about it um, and think what, you know, how could we solve it? So it, it is a relatively simple problem, computationally thinking. Uh, you know, I, I have my own temporal IDs uh, and I have all the temporal IDs of people I was next to. And then the owners of those temporal IDs, they know they are owners of those temporal IDs. I just don't know who they are, right? Um, yeah, so the lecture is until two o'clock. Um, and we normally have a kind of a two hour session. So we will restart at uh, half past one and then go for another half an hour. All right. So I will stop uh, recording for a moment. All right. So any ideas how to do this? So who, who thinks it is possible to notify owners of the IDs that I've met uh, in such a way that no one else will learn who they are and um, no one learns will learn about me, but I will let them know that, um, um, you know, they got in contact with a sick person. So th there are two things here. Um, one is just the notification. So like letting them know that uh, they got sick, such, uh, no, no, that I got sick, such that they were in contact with a sick person. So that's one thing. The second one is, um, 
validating that this notification is legitimate, okay? Uh, we will not do that now, uh, it's, it is, but it is kind of a separate issue, okay? So the first issue is I have my own temporal IDs and I have all temporal IDs of people who were near me and I just need to let them know uh, without letting know anybody else, right? Um, is that possible? Yeah, it, it is a little bit tricky question, but uh, who, who think it, it is possible? And how would you do that? All right, so let's, let's, uh, not after, yeah, no, they are, we are assuming they are valid, okay? So we are assuming the temporal IDs are still valid. We are still within the 14 days period. So nothing has been deleted yet. Okay, so I will leave it for you to think a little bit. I mean, I prepared quite a long lecture. Uh, we're not gonna finish it today. Um, so I think we will come back to this um, in a couple of weeks and I will kind of uh, review the, your kind of understanding of blockchains and kind of related technologies. And then you will see what is the link to this question. Uh, and the link is kind of uh, either very trivial, very simple. Uh, there is quite a simple mechanism to achieve that. Um, but um, we have to kind of review that the technology. So one hint I can give you here is that because we're not sharing location, okay? So I don't really know who to notify. I, I mean, I know who to notify. I, I have the, the temporal IDs, but in the kind of... <laughs> physical space of communication. I don't know, I cannot like do a peer to peer, right? I, I have to broadcast something, right? So um, I will have to broadcast, uh, I, I will have to use a broadcast of some sort, um, unless we use some kind of trickery with sharding and, and things like this. Uh, let's assume we have a very simple system and let, let's assume we have some common kind of uh, infrastructure that I can publish something, you know, on kind of a rendezvous point and then everybody can read it, okay? So, uh, or I can just push notification to everybody, right? But, uh, so I will, like, we, we're assuming I will have to broadcast, but um, most receivers, recipients, recipients will not be able to read it, okay? So even though I'm doing a broadcast, most recipients will ignore it because it's not for them, okay? Only people for whom that is will read it. Um, everybody else will just get it and they will have to ignore it. So because it's a broadcast, uh, it's kind of inefficient, but because we're only using it for notification of sick people, uh, we not need to do it a lot. I mean, you only need to do it once when you get um, uh, tested positive for, for COVID. Um, so we kind of assuming that the broadcast is not so inefficient that it's unusable, okay? Um, so then the question remains um, how to do it. Yes, so Nikolai is on, on, on to something, so... Um, Yeah, that's right. So we can make it, um, yes, exactly. So you don't, um, so, so one 
assumption is that we're doing a broadcast, which in itself is inefficient, right? Uh, but, you know, um, Bitcoin, for example, is using broadcasts like every node in the network needs to learn something uh, when the transaction is issued. And that is kind of inefficient, but it works, right? So we will assume it, it works. The other thing is, if I have traces of people I, were, I was next to, um, then I don't care if within the uh, 15 minutes block, um, I've been exposed to, um, um, to the same person. Like we, we can use this kind of a 15 minutes um, um, resolution. Uh, and then I also don't need to um, know exactly, um, yeah, and anyway, so you, Nikola is right. Uh, we can do something with encryption and with the temporal IDs and with the private public key cryptography to sort of um, use that. So the IDs could be, for example, private keys, uh, public keys, right? Uh, so I'm kind of generating public keys. And then if someone wants to notify me about something, they just encrypt the message with my public key and then nobody else can read it. Um, and then only I will be able to decrypt that, that message, right? Um, and then the message may contain my public key for them to verify that, uh, you know, um, I got sick and they can got kind of double check of when that happened. If there is a reuse of keys, if there is no reuse of keys, they can just work, work it out as long as they kept the keys, right? Um, yeah, so that, that is kind of a simple, simple solution, uh, just to use public key cryptography to, to do the broadcasts. Uh, and then the answer to that question is obvious, like, you know, why would you really need the government to, to, to achieve that? You just need a simple protocol, and then all the apps can kind of a broadcast to, uh, or even do kind of a peer-to-peer -peer broadcast mesh. And I mean, you, you could have a central server kind of, uh, or some rendezvous point um, to, to do the push notification, but you could in theory do, do many types of kind of um, protocols for spreading the information around, um, some more efficient than, than others. All right, so that's kind of the simplest one. What, what else? So one, one possible solution is just use a public key as, um, as temporal ID, right? What else could you use? You can use um, other mechanisms uh, where you obfuscate of, uh, because, you know, th those temporal IDs are only known to you and to the people who have them, right? Nobody else actually knows those temporal IDs because they are, you know, uh, random and kind of private. Uh, they are not uh, uh, spread everywhere. So you could use something like uh, Bloom filters um, to encode a set of IDs that are kind of in your set and then publish it to everybody. And then everybody could check. Um, um, so you could use Bloom filters or you could use um, some uh, zero knowledge proof uh, const construct which would answer yes, no questions. So you would say yes, no. Um, and then if somebody asks with the temporal ID that I've encoded in, into it, it would say yes. And if you've used the ones which I haven't encoded, they, it would say no. But you wouldn't know what has been encoded in here, right? So I would use the set of the temporal IDs that I want to encode into this kind of a construct and then somebody, and, I, and then I would broadcast this construct to everybody. And then every client would, would kind of iteratively go through the 14 days of keys 
and for all the local keys, we'll ask it, okay, is this key in, is this key in, is this key in, is this key in? And then for, if, if all the answers is no, that means none of your keys from your app has been broadcasted. So that means you were not in contact with a sick person. If the answer is yes, that means one of your keys was kind of encoded in the construction, and that means you were in contact with a sick person. You wouldn't know what is inside, right? So the, um, the, the, the construct kind of allows you to kind of encode information in such a way that you cannot reconstruct of what is kind of inside, but you can interrogate it and you can get yes, no answers. You may say, okay, so then what I could do is I could start from zero, 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 zero key and just iteratively interrogate this filter asking for all possible keys. <laughs> and then I will just get all the ones which it says yes to, right? And true, you could do that. But then again, it may or may not be feasible for you to do this exhaustive interrogation of the construct to gain knowledge about which keys were or were not encoded into this particular thing. And even if you've deciphered all the keys, uh, then as we were saying, those temporal IDs are private so, and they are only valid for 14 days and so on. So you again have all those kind of a privacy um, guarantees that are kind of outside of this. So even if this mechanism was feasible, even if you could do that, which for many, uh, you know, we, we can use the uh, temporal IDs of variable length and we can start with a very long ones, um, kind of a, and, and use it in such a way that it may be in, you know, computationally infeasible. Um, so, but that's kind of another one. And there are possible other ones. So we could use kind of another forms like ring signatures or something that again, provides certain guarantees and obfuscates the identities of those temporal IDs in such a way that you can learn whether you were sick or not, uh, whether you were exposed to a sick person or not, but it, you will not learn anything else. Um, all right, so um, blockchain. Um, we covered this topic uh, before. I just want to check, you know, how comfortable are you with some of those um, technologies behind it. So private public key cryptography. That's what we've used to solve this, um, this broadcast thing, right? Um, it's super simple, it's easy. Uh, the private keys, the, the generation of public private keys is kind of uh, pretty um, easy and, and straightforward. You could use those public keys as IDs. Uh, they have kind of a random structure. You cannot reconstruct the private key and you cannot really you know, uh, guess them if the generation is following certain uh, randomness guarantees. Uh, so you know, that, that is pretty straightforward. So th this is kind of a clever way of the usage of public private key cryptography to share something with a group of people such only part of the group will learn about what is being shared, right? Um, so how comfortable are you in kind of using the, the public private key cryptography and have you used it in, in your projects to enhance something like some privacy guarantees or some properties? Anyone used it in, so before, like in any of your projects? Nope. Yeah. Yeah, to some, to some extent. To some extent, we've been kind of using it and trying to use it uh, last semester. Um, okay, so how about hashing? That you should have used. When is hashing useful?
Yes, passwords. So if you ever store any sort of passwords in your apps anywhere and you're not using hashing, you're really doing it wrong. Um, yes. Um, hashing is also very useful for lookups. So when you need a certain guarantees on your lookup performance in your app, you have some sort of uh, data to store or something that you need to look up. Uh, hash tables are kind of extremely useful. And then you can design your own kind of uh, uh, hash functions to represent and to, to have certain guarantees. So for, for lookups and for performance, I've used hashing not in a context of crypto projects kind of specifically, but like in, in games, uh, when you develop certain um, asset lookups or something that, that you need to be quick about. Uh, we also used hashing and, and kind of a tree trickery when we were doing uh, IP address lookups. So IPv4, it's like those four octets. And then when you want to, like if you're doing some sort of a filtering or some sort of um, uh, routing or intrusion detection and so on, often you have rules which, specif which are specified in a bit mask fashion. So for certain address types or categories or ranges, you need to do something. And then looking up for those rules based on those four octets, you really want to do it you know, as quick as possible. Um, and then using a kind of a particular mechanism for hashing and then uh, using the bit operations may improve your, your performance. Um, yeah, we discussed those before. We discussed a consistent hashing last semester for the um, distribution of uh, resources um, across the peer-to-peer the -peer network uh, and a distributed hash table. So these were used kind of last, last semester. Um, so we, yeah, we covered that. So what do you think blockchain is? Where would you think kind of a blockchain would fit into your workflow or where would you see it being useful? Um, so for example, in this problem here, which we were discussing, um, you don't really need blockchain, right? Like you can kind of handle it with some basic crypto uh, without the concept of blockchain. But as I said, there are two aspects. One aspect is notifying everybody that you're sick. And the second aspect is guaranteeing that there is no spam. Like, you know, if people can just notify uh, everybody they are sick, they can create a lot of chaos. Uh, and that is very undesirable. So ability to verify <clears throat> that, somebody's, that somebody is sick and that, not, that um, verification is actually correct, it, it is quite fundamental, right? Um, so in, the <clears throat> in my daughter's school, there was a girl who said uh, that she, she has COVID. And when she said that, the school needs to be closed, right? So then the principal said, well, you know, that, that's great. Uh, you probably should go home and you should get tested. Uh, so when somebody gets tested, that they get some sort of a piece of paper, certain verification mechanism for the principal to know that that actually is correct. And the way it actually works is like if she gets tested positive, the hospital will notify the school, right? Uh, so then the principal knows that it is a legitimate case. Um, if we're talking about the global system, if we're talking about system where this verification needs to be sort of cross-border and, and globally uh, done, then we have a little bit of an issue and our solution, our simple solution doesn't deal with it yet, right? Um, so potentially you could think of something based on the blockchain, but where, where else? Um, so Oscar says transaction recording. Yeah, that's perfect, right? So any system where you need certain transaction or certain exchange between pa parties or, or between entities 
to be recorded and guaranteed, uh, blockchain can kind of offer you this, this type of guarantee. Um, places where you want all actions, transactions recorded in a sequential manner. Yes, so the history is kept. That's, that's exactly how, how it works. That is correct. Um, where else? Yeah, the, 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 the history question is, um, it's an interesting one. So, so usually um, blockchain has um, two characteristics. Uh, it's immutable and the history is kept, right? Those, um, they offer certain guarantees. Because of those two things, blockchain has certain characteristics. So if someone talks about mutable blockchains or blockchains where the history is discarded or changed, then we really don't talk about blockchain in the kind of traditional meaning of the word, right? Um, a, a mutable blockchain is not really a blockchain. It, it's more like a database. Uh, and it has or may not have certain guarantees. Um, so this is kind of a more traditional um, guarantees that the, the blockchain offers, right? Um, sometimes we would like something to be immutable, but we don't necessarily want uh, history to be kept. Like uh, we want certain things to be forgotten. Um, but that can be somewhat achieved even though we have both properties kept. Um, it, it is uh, again semantics and a little bit like the scope, right? So for example, when we set here that we don't want to notify everybody, but then we're using broadcast you may say that it's contradictionary, right? Like we are notifying everybody because it's a broadcast. So everybody will be notified. Yes and no. Like we're using broadcast on a kind of a lower layer, but then the application layer, only the interested recipients will get the message, right? Um, when using ethernet uh, and you're pushing your, your frame into the wire um, and you have a large network, like we kind of on the NTNU campus, and you're pushing your frame from your laptop to the ethernet wire, this ethernet frame will get to every single ethernet device which is connected to that wire, right? Uh, to, to, the, to the next switch. Um, some switches are kind of intelligent and they will kind of a limit of which wire it will go next. So if a switch has like 10 outputs, 10 wires going out, um, it may go onto the single wire, but it may kind of um, go to all. So if you have more than one network card on, on the ethernet wire, all of them will get the, the, the frame. All ethernet devices for whom this frame is not will drop it, right? Um, unless you instruct the network card to be in a snooping mode and you will kind of read all the packets. So then you can kind of investigate what is, what, what is the network doing, even if the packets are not for you. But typically there is a broadcast. It's, it's not peer to peer, right? Uh, we always have that. We always have kind of layers and on some layer, people who are not supposed to get something get, get it anyway, uh, because that's the way to organize um, communication. So here we, we have those two layers and it's the same here. Um, even though we say history is kept, the history is kept on the kind of infrastructure layer, but certain things can be deleted. And then even though on the, on the blockchain layer or the transactions are recorded, the actual data that they link to might have been deleted and might have been gone. 
Um, so you can disintermediate what is actually permanent and what is immutable and what happens with the data. And then the history, the, the history of transactions is kept, but the data might have been already deleted. And same with the details. So you might have some history that is kept, but some of the details of what the transactions was actually about is gone because it was stored outside of the chain, right? Um, okay, so the final one is what are the smart contracts? So do, do we have blockchains with and without smart contracts or what, what are smart contracts? And where would you use them? Yeah, so it is a form of code or some form of logic stored in the chain. Um, does, yeah, so Nikola is correct also. It is some form of um, uh, behavior or logic or kind of um, uh, action that is guaranteed to, to take place, right? Um, under certain conditions. Um, the term smart contract has been coined um, before blockchain era. Uh, and for example, a vending machine is used often as an example of a smart contract. So when we go to a shop, and we buy a drink, we say, I want to buy this Coke. And then the seller says, okay, here is your Coke, but you need to pay. And then you pay. And then you kind of engaging in the kind of a contractual protocol where if you pay, you're gonna get the drink and then the money are becoming the property of the seller and the drink becomes your own property. Before this exchange, the drink is the property of the seller and money is your, yours, right? Um, and after the exchange, some things change hands. And then the vending machine is kind of the, you know, technological encapsulation of this contractual protocol in such a way that at the beginning of the exchange, the drink is inside the machine and the money is with you. At the end of the exchange, the money is with the machine and the drink is with you, right? Um, and then you don't need the seller. You don't need the human to do this contractual agreement between you and the machine, right? Um, so you have, uh, we kind of remove the seller from the shop uh, and we encoded the protocol in such a way that it cannot be um, violated. And, and at least in theory, of course, the machines can broke. Sometimes the, your code gets stuck. Uh, sometimes you cannot put the money in and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, bad things happen, but normally it kind of works. And normally there is no human in the loop to not kind of um, fulfill the obligations, right? Um, so um, does Bitcoin have smart contracts? So the answer to this question is a little bit tricky because it depends how you define uh, what smart contract is. Um, and then if you understand the smart contract as a certain behavior that is executed irrespective of anybody else in the context of certain conditions, then Bitcoin has smart contracts as well. They are quite limited. That you cannot express everything with them, but you can express certain guarantees or certain logic that will happen when certain conditions are met. Um, so an interesting, for example, interesting uh, property of, of blockchain systems is a concept of atomic swaps. And the concept of atomic swap is that you can swap a digital asset with somebody without a trusted third party and then you cannot uh, cheat in the exchange. Same as with the vending machine, if you're buying a Coke and paying for it, it should never happen that one of the contractual partners gets both the drink and the money, right? You either get the drink 
or you get the money, but you cannot get both. So in the atomic swap, it, it is the same. And you can encode this with the Bitcoin contracts. Uh, they typically are not called smart contracts because this term is you know, a little bit monopolized by Ethereum and uh, some of the other blockchain uh, groups. Uh, but you, you cannot have a blockchain system without a certain um, ability to encode logic. And this ability to encode logic is kind of, you know, um, often called smart contracts and they differ in expressiveness. How much can you express in those contracts? So in Ethereum, you can, you know, ultimately express Turing like computations. You can express everything. In the Bitcoin blockchain, you can only express certain things, but not all possible things. Uh, so you may say then it's not really a smart contract because it's limited. But it, it again, it depends a little, a little bit on the semantics. Um, so we ran out of time. Um, I had uh, the lecture planned a little bit longer. I covered most of it before. So I was kind of hoping to uh, show you some of the examples and, uh, and then get to the Ethereum and um, play a little bit with the smart contracts there. So what I propose is you will go to slide 63 uh, and using the list of tools, you will install a uh, node, you will install uh, the uh, blockchain explorer um, for Ethereum, uh, private, private uh, chains, and then you will install MetaMask extension to your browser and Truffle. Um, you don't need to install Remix. Uh, it, it is IDE based anyway, so uh, no need to play with Remix, but install like th this you probably already have because you've been playing with web tech for a while. Uh, install those extra three things. This is a browser ex extension, and this is like a command line uh, tool chain for playing with uh, Ethereum network on your laptops locally. And this is kind of a nice visualization tool uh, which is not strictly needed, like you can do development and play around just with those two, but it's quite nice to see it in a graphical form. So install those three, three things, and then the next time we meet and revisit these topics, um, what we will do is we will kind of play a little bit with the technology related to smart contracts and to Ethereum, and we will talk a little bit more of where and how blockchain technology may add value to some of your projects, okay? Um, so if I go to the proposed lectures, I think um, that will sort of be probably middle of October, okay? So we have a couple of lectures planned um, and the next lecture will be about um, identity systems with Abilay. Then we will have two, um, two lectures related to data science. And for this, I, I would like you to install uh, Python and Jupyter, Jupyter Notebooks. So yeah, I will kind of don't mess up with the slides here. I will edit here. So edit. Rene will, will contact you, but um, I will say install Python and Jupyter notebook if you haven't played with it before. Um, and then uh, with these ones, um, yeah, so to be announced, it will most likely be 14th of October. We will do another lecture and um, try blockchain continued and then do truffle uh, metamask and this one. Um, so we will play a little bit with Ethereum and with some of the uh, smart contracts and you know what it means to to work with this 
tech. From one hand, it's super easy. Like with the tools, you can develop smart contracts relatively straightforward. And we had Betrol groups last semester doing some work with um, uh, Norsk Tipping for the um, identity system. Um, on the other hand, it also changes some of your mental thing as a developer because um, of the immutability property and because of the smart contract nature, you have to think a little bit ahead of what might go wrong and kind of address all the things up front. You, you, it's, it's really tricky for, you know, updating things if get, they get hacked and, and so on. Like things get really messed up. Um, it is the same with mobile apps uh, because mobile apps, if you deploy them on the app stores, you have no guarantee that all the users will update your apps as you want this to happen. So you may have users which are using version one, you may have users using version two and version three, and then the interplay between your own versions, it's a little bit tricky, right? Um, so with the, um, with the blockchain apps and with this, tech, it, it is similar. Uh, security is a little bit weird, development is a little bit weird, and getting a little bit of an exposure will, will kind of uh, make you, you know, a little bit better rounded in ability to advise if the blockchain solution is or is not suitable for something. All right, so the plan is we have um, three more lectures planned, then we will come back to the blockchain. Um, I will check some of the topics coming up from the projects uh, and also then I will check like what is really useful for your projects. We, we want to cover some AI and some um, yeah, machine learning uh, topics here. And then we'll have kind of a review of, yeah, this one was, this one is broken. This is um, not data science, it's a project review. projects review. So I would like you to kind of try to set a milestone for yourself around 7th of um, October uh, for kind of a reviewing progress on, on your projects. So I've, I've seen Nikolai did a really good job in providing some more details for his project. I would, you know, I encourage everybody else to do the same. Um, I am yeah, so I'm over time. So that's it. A any questions? I don't want to extend it anymore. I'm eating up into your break. <laughs>